Hi, uh, welcome uh, to my show tonight, folks. Uh, I'm uh, Tom Russell. I'm your venerable, humble host for Life Without Limits. And, uh, you know, I, 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 people have been following my show for quite some time. Like uh, two years ago when I embarked on the show, I didn't have a clue what I was going to do to create the show, uh, you know, that revolved about making the human condition better. But each week, I somehow managed to find guests who, for lack of a better word, they, they rock. They rock. They, they, they share some things that I never thought would be uh, so important. Uh, but, but it's a challenge. It's, it's a challenge to, to find guests uh, for my show all the time. But that's what I love about it because I do research. You know, I, read, I read the Internet and uh, I check things uh, on TV and, I, and I, I read the newspaper and I, touch, I find people uh, for, for that. So this is uh, where all of you come in. And I know I have uh, thousands of people across the world. Um, and if any of you is listening to the show and, and you believe you have a story to tell that's going to inspire all my other listeners, just send me a message. Uh, email me to a lifewithoutlimitshow.com. That's, that's lifewithoutlimitshow.com. And, you know, and while you're looking uh, at the site, if you feel that you, you appreciate what I'm doing with the show and, and like to help me uh, – I keep uh, my show on the air. You can go to one of the three tiers for fan support, and you can do it with PayPal, which is very, very secure. And uh, it, you know, without your support, uh, this show, it, it, it never happened. So whoever has helped me out, uh, I really, really appreciate that. And and you, you can also, when you scroll down, you'd be able to to find my uh, two incredibly popular books. Uh, the first one is Finding New True North: A Bully Teen's Journey of Hope. And the uh, second is Nowhere Man. And the Finding True North, I'm really happy with it because, you know, if, if you have a son or daughter being bullied or, or if you, even if you're an adult who's feeling oppressed uh, by someone else, this is the book to read. And I'm not saying this because I wrote it, but I've had so many people, so many people contact me on my book that has impacted their life uh, or their children's lives. So when you look at that, uh, go and you check it out with lifewithoutlimitshow.com. And uh, I gain new listeners all the time. So anybody who's new to my show, I have been so blessed uh, the past two years to highlight guests who, under normal circumstances, would have every right uh, to throw in the towel considering some of the dire, traumatic events that occurred in their lives. But time and, and time again, I just marvel at their resilience and, and fortitude you know, to say to others, uh-uh, not me, not me, man, not today. I don't care that I have suffered greatly in my life, I refuse to give up on myself. Can you imagine how freeing that is? I think it all boils down to you ultimately to determine how you feel about yourself. And I read, I read this quote uh, the other day, and it said, uh, make sure you don't start seeing yourself through the eyes of those who don't value you. Know your worth even if they don't. And uh, that, those are powerful words. And the reason why I bring this up is the guest, my guest tonight, Victor Vargas, oh my gosh, he's going to be—he's going to be incredible uh, tonight. Uh, Victor is is a Mexican American who experienced abuse uh, from others from all fronts, and, and many people go through what he did. Like I said before, they've just given up and said life wasn't worth it. And to be honest, Victor felt that when he was a young kid. But when you hear a story, if you don't get a tear in your eye or a tug in your heart. You're not listening. You need to listen to a story. Victor is that important. And uh, and having said that, Victor, I am so humble. Uh, I'm so humbled to have you on my show. I appreciate that. Oh, thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, we've we've talked for quite some time, uh, Victor, oh, off and on. And uh, again, a lot of the shows I have, I talk to my guests like weeks in advance. And uh, I always worry about how things are going to work out, but tonight uh, we it's it's simpatico. We are we are one. So, um, yes. Victor, Victor, before we start, can you tell me a little bit about yourself, your your bio? Yeah. So, well, I'm Mexican American. I actually um, I was born in Sterling, Illinois. I was actually born to two immigrant parents. Uh, they came from Mexico, and decided we'd go to well when I was still a little baby. I decided to move to Indiana. Um, growing up for me, you know, childhood that 
as I grew up, I had dreams. There were things I wanted to do. And a couple of those dreams that I do now is actually I do music. It's one, one of my biggest things right now. And with COVID coming around, it's so hard going to do you know, you presentations, right. speaking. Um, with the book that I wrote, Almost Bully to Death, that was one of my things I was able to go speak. But with COVID stopping me, it just kind of made a little bit of a pause with that. Uh, obviously, as you can see, it's not a complete pause forever. It's just something we have to maneuver around. And, um, well, in that time frame, since that took a pause, I just been kind of spent time with family as well as continue to grow, figure out ways that I can help improve myself as well as be able to help others. Uh, one of the ways that I've been kind of doing is doing learning, reading a little bit more. And I'm still doing schooling actually for music. So music production is one of my things. Mm. And music for me was uh, part of my outlet. So it, there's kind of like a calling from that. And I use my music to help with speaking to others. Um, that's one of my things that I was able to at least talk with a lot of people that, oh, well, listen, what music do you listen to? And kind of start off that, break that ice, more or less. Yeah. So that was one of, that's a little bit about me as far as, I mean, I do have um, three little ones. And that's one of the biggest parts is trying to, trying to be someone there for them so that they don't go through the same experience, which, you know, I can't stop whatever happens in their life. But as long as that they know that there's an outlet for them to come to and understand that, you know, I've been down certain roads as well, too, that they can come speak to me. It's kind of my goal to be a, they're hopefully one of their role models compared to anybody else as, as well in their life. And that's, and that's why I had you on the show, because I want to find out, <clears throat> I want to let the listeners know the genesis of that, how, how, how your life was to get to your point now. Um, now, now, when you were young, you led a pretty joyful life but things changed for you when you started going to school um like you're a mexican american as you said did you feel your target with the other kids because of your ethnicity you know in the very beginning i didn't understand um i looked as i got a little bit older i did notice that yes it was my ethnicity um even though there were some times that they would like they were kind of more it was very out there it was very blunt like i i had some kids that they would tell me you know where are you from? Um, this would be when I was first growing up there in my town, there really wasn't many Hispanic kids. There's very, very few. Uh, I think in my whole school at that time, really probably no more than like five in that whole elementary school. Um, so it was a little bit difficult for me because I felt a little different because at my house, we spoke Spanish. That's my first language. So when I went to school, my English was a little broke. Like it wasn't really perfected wasn't that well and people were able to kids were able to pick it up real real quick I and mean, kids are intelligent so they were like oh where are you from oh from here oh you're you're mexican yeah and my mom always told me you know you're mexican american and that eventually started to not eventually like really right away started breaking them off like oh we don't want to play with you or you can't hang out with us. So they just ignore me completely. And a little bit later, there was Hispanic kids, Mexican kids. But these were Mexican kids that were born in Mexico. So them being young as well, they recognize that there's a difference between them and me being the fact that I was born here in the United States. So I, that's, I did see that ethnicity being my separation between both of them. So it, it was something that kept me be away from both sides, you know, stuck in the middle. And it's got to be tough uh, thinking that you're on, on the outside looking in and you you weren't accepted in any group. Uh, right. How, how did you, I mean, this is like when you were eight years old. So, I mean, eight years old, it's kind of probably hard to figure out maturity-wise what that all meant. Did, did you feel like, did you understand what racism was all about then? Not really. I just kind of, I kind of more, my mom would more or less just kind of told me, you know, that um, just trying to ignore it because they were just kind of being mean and some of them just didn't know, you know, how to 
how to talk to me. They just didn't know me. So she, that's one thing with my parents. I'm very grateful that they never had me respond in a negative way back. You know, they always try to have me respond in polite ways. And for me, I didn't really comprehend it that much of why, why they did those things. Like I didn't understand, for, for instance, I'm not that dark in skin color. So, you know, I come mm-hmm. with, they would say a lighter shade of brown that compared to other Mexicans that are a little bit darker than me. So it's like, I didn't understand why I'm like, I'm almost like a skin color was one of the things like, I'm not that far different. And then I'd have Mexicans doing the same thing. Like, I didn't understand. It's like, I speak your language, you know, my family is from Mexico. So I didn't fully understand it at that time. No. Now, then uh, a few years later, uh, can you talk about what happened when you were 12, when someone came up to you with a gun? So that was, so just to give a little feedback there, growing up from when I was I guess you say from first grade to third grade, we, uh, my parents lived in a neighborhood where it was not the best, to be honest. I mean, we lived in an area where I remember it was an apartment and it was like a modular apartment. So basically two apartments side by side, um, the only thing divided was a wall in between the both of us. And on a corner, we lived in a dead end and there was on a corner that there was constant, um, at that, I, remember, I remember at that time when I was a young kid, I used to just call them drunk people because there were just these adults that you would hear them all the time. They're just out there drinking, you hear them yelling, you hear them partying. Eventually you start hearing gunshots. So I wasn't that far away from hearing gunshots. I was not far away from hearing car alarms, um, even car windows being broke. So that was between first and third grade. My parents then decided to move to a different area and um, to get a home and kind of get away from that. Just kind of, you know, as an adult, you're trying to do better for your family. So when we moved to a new area, I was in the summer of fourth grade. Mind you, through all the bullying that I had already experienced between first and third grade, I already knew how to handle it. Like, I knew there, I wouldn't walk to home all the time, but there was occasional times my mom allowed me to go walking home. And there was some of those times where people, they would actually jump me on the way from home to school. And it wasn't that many blocks away. It's not like I had to walk a far, far distance. But that would happen. And I eventually learned shortcuts, different routes to avoid them. That was something that to me like okay I, I know I know my map you know I know which way to go I know which way it is easiest to avoid them when we moved I had to relearn everything and you know one of the things for kids is like we'll I have to make friends again you know I have to make new friends because all my other friends are at the other school to me that was one of my things because I already I already knew some of the friends that I had even though some of those people were being mean and bullying me I kind of had to hold it in hold it in just so that I wouldn't express that. And when I moved to a new place, it was just something different because I didn't know different ways how to, where to avoid people. Who are the people I had to stay away from? Where are those people, um, were there certain areas maybe that had houses that were people that, adults that were drinking and partying and causing um, disruption? I didn't know that. So, I met a couple of friends there that were not that far away from my house and we would play baseball. My job was a person that played soccer. Uh, that's what growing up for me. And for them, they played baseball a lot. So I just wanted to have new friends, I wanted someone to play with. And that's what I did. I played with them. But one of the things that I didn't find out until the first experience was when they had told me, Hey, so there's these kids that if they come by, we have to take off running. Like, whatever we're playing, we just got to go home. Like, you, you don't want to be stuck out around with them. Well, I didn't understand that. You know, come from where I came from, that I understood that over there because that 
I was experienced that constantly. But here they're telling me about people that I've never met or seen before. Well, the first time that I had these people come, um, we took off, they all took off running. So when they took off running, I took off running as well. Went back to my house. That was the end for that night. We, we were playing uh, baseball. So that was it. The time with the gun incident, it was a similar situation. By that time, I already knew. Like, these were, they were kind of like a family. There were a couple brothers and the cousins. And um, they were, the oldest was in gang affiliation, which at that exact time, I didn't know that fully. Like, I knew, I heard, but I didn't fully know. Well, there was an incident where they kind of caught us off guard. We were kind of playing. And... So when the incident that had happened was that I remember my dad asking me, he asked me, he's like, hey, I got to go pick up your aunt. Um, do you want to stay or come along with me? And I was like, no, I'll stay. We're playing baseball. He's like, okay, well, I'll be back in a few. So I didn't know that. Normally I always go through the back door and I didn't know that um, that door was going to be um Locked or unlocked, I didn't know none of that. I didn't really even ask. But when these kids came through an alleyway, we all fled through the front. So we're in the backyard. We all fled through the front. Everyone scattered to their house. And I went to the front of my house. When I went to the... We, my parents had lived in a house that has an enclosed porch. When I ran up in there, um, I tried opening the door, and the door was locked. At that exact moment, my heart's already beating fast because I already know it what's going on like they're coming and we had to run away so my heart's beating fast because i can't get in my house now and i'll now i'm starting to panic like, what do i do well when i was there and i couldn't get the door open i remember just you know jumping down on the ground crouching and not trying to peek not trying to make a sound trying to maintain my breath my breathing habit like it was just i remember and i can still even feel it now like remembering it just, I felt like I'd ran so many miles and I came to a dead stop. And at that moment, like, I'm still trying to see if there's a key somewhere. I can't even find nothing. I'm like, like, my dad, he's not even home. Where do I go? So I was listening to seeing if the people were around there. And I didn't hear them. So I was like, okay. I was like, well, my friend lives... It was really interesting because it was my parents' house, then the house that they would always go hang out with, and then my friend's house. So all those three houses right there next to each other. I had to cross through that middle house to get to my friend's house. So I was like, well, I don't hear nobody. I'll just hurry up and run over to my friend's house. And I'll stay there until my dad gets home, and then I'll come back. So I listened again, didn't hear nothing. I said, all right, it's my perfect time to take off running and just go over there. I remember just opening that porch door and it took off running. And I didn't even get, I didn't even get halfway to that house. And the um, two of the guys got me. They stopped me. And um, the third one starts coming around. And they're all laughing. And they're holding me from my arms and my shoulder, one on each side. <clears throat> and at that moment they started telling me they're like the oldest one especially he's the one that was doing most of the talking he's like you're not going nowhere and I was like Lord, just just let me go like I'm just trying to go over to my friend's house no you're, you're not going like this is the end This you're not going to make it out of here alive and he had a gun on him already and I seen it and at that exact moment, my heart started racing because I lived in a neighborhood where <clears throat> it was pretty calm. And uh, I was expecting that <clears throat> hopefully somebody would just open their door. Somebody would be outside. A car would even drive by to see me and basically in danger. And to be able to stop it. But nobody in sight would come by. 
nobody was around. And I was trying to like rustle myself out of it. And uh, they held me back and they held me tighter. Uh, and then he puts the gun to my forehead. When, uh, when he did that, I remember just closing my eyes and I was just, just saying, you know, just let me go. Just don't even say nothing. Just let me go with my friends. Just let me live. Honestly, uh, there is a higher power that was watching over me because I remember the gunshot. I remember gunshot firing off and I just went deaf. Like I didn't even know where I was at for a quick second. I didn't know at that exact moment what happened. I didn't know if I was I don't know if I was dead <clears throat> dead or what happened. He, he's like, get out of here catch you again you're gone took off running my friend's house and I'm banging on the door and my friend wouldn't even open the door for me at that moment because he thought he was it was one of the other guys I started asking me if I was by myself and I'm like dude just let me in just let me in this house I remember he once he cracked the door open a little bit he just finally let me in I'm in there and and I started learning that When I, when I asked him why he wouldn't do nothing, he's like, did you hear the gunshots? <clears throat> he's like, yeah, I heard the gunshot. Like, and you didn't do nothing? He goes, no, because then they might come after me. Some friend. So I learned real quick that not everybody was going to be there. How did that change you? Because, I mean, you, you, you obviously escaped being shot but i mean because yeah, uh, you you know we're uh, need to move this on a little bit but you started cutting yourself and you contemplated suicide um was that about the time that you were doing that that started actually a little bit right after that um the bullying still continued that i started facing and um it was just because in middle school it became a little bit harder immediately first day of school i was like immediately getting bullied in middle school so when that was happening, I didn't talk to my parents. My parents didn't even know what was going on since I was a child. So I didn't know how to relieve that pain. I didn't know how to get rid of it. And to me, it was just one of the things that I don't, I, honestly, I don't even remember how I picked it up. I don't know where I learned it. I don't remember. All I just remember is one day just grabbing a razor blade and just started cutting myself. And some people, um, that have done it, you know, to them, it's trying to take the life away. But for me, it was just to relieve that pain. I felt like every time I cut myself and just blood came out, I felt that that drop of blood that came out was one piece of that pain that was relieving out of my body. So that's the method that I used. And that was from like sixth grade. That's early. That's early. But then, then a little bit later on, you decided wrong. And I'm, I don't, I don't want to be on this end anymore. I'm so tired of this. And you found out you decided to become a, a gang. Um, how did that happen? Yeah, so the way that, that happened was when I was getting bullied. And my, uh, I was still cutting and all that was going on. But there was these kids that just continued on and continued on. And there was just a group of them. And I had met a friend there that he had came from out of, out of a different state and went to that school. And... He had uh, he had offered me if I wanted to be in the gang and stuff, and he was, it wasn't like it was this huge gang or anything like that. It was something that was more of a local thing, and I knew about the gangs. Like I learned about it, and I was like, no, that's not for me. Eventually, what happened was that that bullying from that group of people continued on and continued on. That I remember one time in lunch, we kind of almost got into a fight, and I just had it. But I knew that when I shoved 
the other guy, his other friends were ready there to back him up. And the only reason I didn't continue on was because the lunch lady stopped us and told me to go on to a different line. Never even seen what he was doing, so he never got in trouble. But I knew that at that moment that that was going to be the end. Like, I was, they were going to come after me. So I went to the guy and my, my friend. I went to him and I was like, look, I'll join the gang, but I need some help now, like, immediately. And he was all for it. And from then on, for, like, next you know, two years, roughly, I was with them. And I immediately felt the lost thing that I thought I was missing was that brotherhood, that family love that I thought I needed. I thought I found it there with them. And that's where I I joined with them from that moment. And then, and then obviously, I, I've never been in the gang. I haven't really followed that very often. But from what I, from what I saw in the video, it was like, you can be in a gang, but uh, a lot of the gang members are not loyal to each other. It's uh, basically kill or be killed, right? Um, right. Uh, how did you end up getting out of the gang? So that that's one of the hardest things is you, they say, I mean, you can get out, but you're really never going to get out. They'll come looking for you. You know, you're either that or you're, you're dead. For us, the way this gang was going was that, yeah, there's punishment. There's all that. But it started falling apart. Um, there wasn't, there were some people that, that were part of it. Like how you said, like, there's there's not the full loyalty. They're not always there for you. And there was one of the members that he got in trouble and started ratting everybody out. Mm-hmm. When he started doing that, everybody else was like, no, I'm done. Like, they're coming after this. Police started going to their houses. Um, they were getting searched. So they're like, it's going to be done, like, but at that exact moment, I didn't know. You know, just people were starting to, to leave out of it. So I remember at the time I kept continuing on, and finally I was like, "There's like nobody in this gang. Like, there's legwork is not there." So I, I was like, "You know what? You know, I'm just done with this. Like, I'm, I'm done. I'm not trying to be in this no more. If I have to get punished, whatever it is, I don't even care no more." And he kind of just let me walk. He's like, "He's like, I can't." That's do hard to believe. I, that's is? really hard yeah. to believe. I would. Um, the, Really, the only reason I would say I was more able to walk and just all that is because there was no more members really to pull punishment. There was really, I was kind of one of the last ones to it. So it's like, you don't have nobody else. And if you didn't do no punishment to nobody else, you're going to put the punishment on me. So that's kind of more or less how I was able to get out. So you were on the, you were on the uh, both sides of this, being bullied and and being the bully. How did that change you? What, uh, after you got out of the gang, how did that change you to... Uh, I don't know, I guess the best word I can think of is to redeem yourself, to change your life. You know, honestly, I I never thought of myself ever make ever being anything. I never thought I was going to be anything in my life uh, after all that. And just felt like all my life was just nothing. So when, um, when that started all coming to an end, it's like there's something that was coming forward because I was offered – a uh, scholarship you know it was a program um, I had to go through and I was going to be offered a scholarship so first I was like no this is not for me like I have no plans of going to school no college nothing my mom would ask me the um, the college band advisor she was constantly trying to get me like oh come on just join with it you know you never know down the road well that uh Eventually, uh, this one, I remember like it was close to the summer, it was in the summer that something just hit me. Like, I, I was like, you know what? I, I want to do better. I want to, I've already got out of that game. You know, I just want to do a little bit better. And I took a chance, filled out the application. I went and turned it in. A couple of weeks later, I get called and said that I'm accepted into that program. So from that moment, I was like, I felt that I had an opportunity in life to make something of myself that I never thought I could. And that right, was I think my, this, you know, go ahead. I was going to say like, that was the way that I was able to feel like I was, I could redeem myself. And I think that what's really cool, because when I saw this in the video, I just said, yes, yes. I mean, I, I, it's like, it's like a epiphany for you when, 
when you were in school and uh, they asked you to speak in a school assembly, what, how did that transpire? Oh, that, that was from one of my amazing friends, um, Betty. Um, she, she was one of the people that helped me along with the book and she helped me to kind of push me up and said, you know, give it a go. Like just, you know, what if we put you in front of people and you can speak your story? By that time, though, she had already kind of just been my motivation. And when she said, you know, I have this presentation that we can have you do, I was just in shock. Looking back that everything that I'd been through, that I was going to have the opportunity to speak to somebody, not just somebody, it was many kids to be able to speak about my life and hopefully make a difference, at least into one person. That was something that became a total shock to me. But yet it was that ongoing, like, I finally feel like I'm making a difference, especially because I didn't feel like I could ever do anything for myself. Now I'm doing it for some other person to be able to help them out. So it was really to Betty, which I always thank for that opportunity, because from that moment on, she was able to let me, I guess, open up what I never knew that I had inside of me, that gift, you could say. Yeah, a little, little side note uh, that Betty he's referring to is uh, Betty Hefner. She was uh, my guest uh, uh, two times, actually three times, when she interviewed me. But And if anybody listened to uh, the show with Betty, uh, Betty and Victor will, will say the same thing. Betty tells it like it is, and when he, she sees the potential in someone, uh, man, she goes with it. And uh, oh yes, and so so obviously when you met Betty and and you just kind of get drawn to her, and you start believing in her because she believes in you, right? And uh, and I I Betty is is such a tremendous person. I I want to throw that in there because if, if anybody wants to listen to Betty's show, go to go to my archives and listen to it, and you'll understand. But you know when you uh, you know when you get up there was like an out of body experience like uh, uh, yeah I mean you were getting emotional talking about the, the the time with the gun did you get emotional when you went up there and talked and you know I I did it I think it was more of the fact that that first time I was kind of like in shock yet kind of like nervous so all my emotions were kind of flying everywhere and um, we were having like little little breaks in between so like they could watch like a little video clip or something so that kind of allowed me to kind of stay relaxed with it but inside honestly I kind of just went and I don't remember like how the whole thing went at that exact moment until afterwards it was just kind of like going and going and going and I don't um I was just kind of in that moment and uh, no I I did feel like I was getting choked up and I, I, there was times where I was like, maybe I shouldn't, you know, just let out, you know, get that choked up. But more or less, I was just kind of more trembling of like speaking. That was one of my hardest things is just speaking in front of people. Well, I know what it's like because you know, I've, I've spoken to schools and I, you kind of watch the crowd and, and seeing how, how it affects them. You know, when, when you talk to kids and they come up to you and they tell you about your experiences, uh, does that just kind of validate what you're talking about? Oh, yes. I remember a couple kids coming to me and them telling me, like, they were going through the exact same thing of being bullied. And some of them just saying, like, I just didn't think, like, I could do anything. I felt like I was nothing. And you came here and you spoke to me. And they, and th those were the words like you spoke to me. Like it wasn't like you spoke to us. You spoke to me. Where there, I felt like I was able to reach into somebody's heart and be able to help them. And that was like, just, uh, like a million dollars to me. That's what it felt like. I just received yeah. a million dollars. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's a tremendous feeling. So Victor, you you are changing lives. You, you may not feel it sometimes, but. Every time you go up and speak to, to uh, a crowd, you know that your your story is resonating with these with these kids. And uh, uh, I can't wait for you to get back uh, back on the circuit again because uh, 
your story needs to be told and your power and your passion uh, needs to be out there. So uh, whenever you can get out there, man, it's going to, it's going to be a great time. I, I want to see you oh, speak. Yeah. I got to see you speak. We live close by. So as right. you do this, I want to know, cause I'm going to be there. I promise you that. Um, now, now you, after with the speaking and everything, then you decided, well, you know, and this is a lot, what happens a lot is I want to tell my story, but you decided to write your own book and, and how did that uh, come about? So, the book actually was, I wrote the book beforehand, and it was interesting because I, through all school, I struggled with English and reading. I, being, Spanish was my first language, I struggled with it, so I would never expect it. And I was actually told that I would never be able to do something like that because I, I can't write properly, I had trouble. And reading was difficult for me in my younger years. So, like, you, you won't be able to do nothing if you don't get this right. You'll never well, be able to, to say to you. <laughs> and when I got, when I talked to my story with Betty, she, she said, that's a story that needs to be spoken to yep. people. You know, you need to write a book. But I already had it in my mentality. Like, it, I was told I could never do something like that. I can't do that. I can't write. And I felt like it was hard, too, because just to speak about my life. Because my parents didn't know at that time what was going on. So she kind of every once in a while we talked and she would kind of like bring it up again to the point that I was like, you know what? I feel ready that I need to write this book. And I would say that if it wasn't for Betty, if she would have just stopped that first time I said I didn't want to at this moment, like I just don't I feel comfortable. If she would have stopped, I probably wouldn't have ever wrote that book until later time. Are you kidding me? Do you think Betty would stop? No. Not a chance. <laughs> no. Not a chance. I mean, uh, she, she's on I me mean, like wet rice because, I mean, she uh, she knows she knows me. She knows you. And, yeah. Uh, I'm so glad that you listened to her. I'm so glad she kept up at, uh, with you. Oh, me too. Yeah. Yeah, I am so happy that she was able to because it was more of different accomplishments there, writing the book being able to do something that people said that I couldn't be able to do. What's and the name of the book again? The book is called Almost Bullied to Death. Almost Bullied to Death. And where do they get it? So they can go to heyugly.org and get it through there or go to a direct website at almostbullytodeath.com. Okay, good. Now you, you mentioned something that I, I that I just washed over me. I had a question about this. You wrote the book and you just mentioned that your parents, your family didn't know anything that you were going through but you put right. it in the book uh once it came out obviously they read the book how did that conversation go so back again my parents uh being a household that they don't speak spanish they didn't actually get fully a chance to read the book so what happened was i was scared to release that book and betty had mentioned you know you should talk this to, with your parents and i was like um uh, might mean i shouldn't probably even tell them like, I'll just release it. I just won't even tell him. She's like, but that's not going to be good once they find out. So it kind of, like, stayed on me. And I thought about it and thought about it. And then I remember the day. It was in December um, December 10th, 2018. So mind you, I've been through this so many years. But December 10th, 2018, I sat with my parents. And I told them my story through everything. And... They were in shock because they tried doing so much to protect me. They didn't realize how much was going on. And when I told them that I wrote a book, they were more than happy. And I thought I thought that they were going to be like mad at me. I thought they were going to hate me because I'm yeah. like, I, you know, they don't know this. But no, they it was a total reverse of what I thought. They were so happy for me. And they said that I'm doing something that's great for others. And that just made my book feel even more enjoyable because they, I knew that they knew what I was went through and that they enjoyed what I did of writing this book to help others. That it it became such a relief to finally like let my parents know, and that literally took a big, huge burden off my shoulders too, because I held it yeah. for so many years. Did uh, you know? Were you holding it back for all those years, and they finally found out about? It, did they kind of feel like? I don't know, that, like they failed you because they didn't see the signs? Yeah, they they did tell me, like, you know, they did feel like 
they felt hurt because they were like, you know, we're trying to protect, but I guess we didn't do as much and feel like they weren't there. And I had to explain to them, like, you guys tried to, like, they would try to ask me, you know, how my day was going and stuff like that. And I would just eventually try to avoid it. Um, and they were, my mom, she was always very asking me. She would always be like, hey, you know, how's it going? And she'd keep on asking. And I just, I learned how to lie for it and how to avoid it and just kind of put that face that shows I'm okay, but deep inside I really wasn't. And I'm like, so don't blame yourself for it because I don't think that there was anything that you could have done. I don't think there's anything you could have done that would have probably made a difference. I would have tried to find other ways to hide it. So, yeah, they, they felt hurt at that time. But when we sat and talked, we kind of realized, like, there's a reason why I kind of went through that in my life. And there's a reason why I had to go through that. And I think to where I'm at today, it explains my reason because I had to make a difference in someone's life. So I had to experience what I had to go through. Yeah, that's uh, I, when when you start talking about this, because you t- talk to kids and everything. And you tell these kids what you did or didn't do um, uh, about all this. What, what kind of advice do you give them? One of the main things I tell kids is to be able to talk to somebody that they trust. Um, sometimes, you know, friends, it seems like our friends are at a younger age, some of our friends that we can trust them, we can tell them things. But I, I truly try to have them speak with somebody, maybe an adult, someone that's really going to be able to sit with them and try to listen and hopefully try to get them maybe some advice, maybe just even to speak but not to hold it in, um, not to just, you know, even if you write it in a diary and stuff like that, that's still holding it in. It's best to speak to somebody and release your emotions. Um, that's one of the biggest things I try to help people do in teens because that's something I didn't do. And really, like, as far as not to do is to not bully yourself. Because sometimes mm. when we get bullied, when we get hurt, things like, oh, you're ugly or you're never going to be able to do this. You're never going to make it. Those get stuck in our head. And then as the day goes on or weeks go by, we start to self-bully ourselves and start telling us, like, you're sitting there and you're like, you're never going to make nothing out of yourself. And instead, try to think positive thoughts. Try to tell yourself, like, I try. One of the things I tell some people is, Every morning, look in the mirror and tell yourself 10 wonderful things about yourself. You know, things that you know how to do, things that you look, you know, even if you don't think that you're attractive, if you don't think that you're that great, tell yourself that you are because it'll boost your self esteem up. And those are really the three main top things I tell people to do because those are ones that now I started doing a lot. And it's just a lot easier for me to now see like the things that I didn't see before about myself to being great. And that's hard to do when you're talking with kids, particularly in, you know, middle school where they're still trying to find themselves and they get constantly inundated with negative, uh, uh, comments about all the time. And you start believing it, you know? Right. Um, and you gotta, you gotta turn it around. And I like the idea about, uh, you know, positive reinforcement, uh, positive affirmation because it's, it's difficult. Now, the thing that uh, intrigued me about this, because uh, you know, a lot of times bullies forget that they bully you. They 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 forget it. And but you had one guy who came up to you, and you knew he was a bully, and he came up to you, and and it wasn't what you expected. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So it uh it kind of happened where it always goes back to Betty. Um, she had, uh, always she does. <laughs> It was something that she suggested that, you know, to kind of forgive other people and just to kind of talk to the people that maybe I would have hurt or they did, even if they hurt me. So I decided that I would message some of my bullies, that main one particularly that was my main bully for a good amount of years. Messaged them. I was scared. I got a reply back um, thinking that I thought the worst. But he come and say, you know, that he was one day was trying to actually say hi to me, but he didn't want to because he he didn't know how I would react, so he kind of just left it there. But he goes, I've been wanting to, you know, say hi to you and see how you're doing. 
And I apologized to him, and he appreciated it. And he's like, you know, I'm kind of said he was sorry. And seen him actually um, at the store probably a couple weeks after that. And just, you know, just, hey, how you doing? Doing good. And kind of feedback. And actually, crazy enough is I just actually seen him um, this weekend. Mm. And just it's still, it's just like, it's almost as if nothing ever happened. Like, you know, back of my mind, yes, I know. But we, there's, like, a respectful, mutual um, talk. Like, we're able, you know, to say, hey, how are you doing? Good. And, you know, hope you're still doing good in your life. And that's some of the words that he told me. Mm-hmm. So that was amazing to hear after being afraid that this was a bully that I had that I would say we had a lot of problems growing up there. How do you get the... Uh, yeah. Because it's, it's got to be kind of challenging because, you know, in your mind, you're remembering all the things he did to you. And in his mind, he just wants to wipe, I shouldn't say wipe it under the under the carpet or the rug. But uh, uh, how do you release that angst, that that feeling of, of, don't you realize what you did to me? It's, it's part of the forgiving part. Yeah. I had to learn that part that I had I had to first start off forgiving myself saying you know like what happened you know that wasn't my fault and from there learning that to forgive other people and that's probably the hardest thing to do is forgive others because like you said like you want to tell them like don't you realize like the pain that you caused me but it's like I don't want to say forget about what happened because you can't forget about some of those things like they're right. stuck in my mind but don't let them eat you away because as you grow older sometimes like you said like the bullies sometimes they they forget or they just don't want to revisit back again and feel like they've hurt people they want to move on and who knows maybe one day you can just sit and talk with them you know down the line and you know express you know yeah this is what i felt but you do it in a calmly manner. That's probably mm-hmm. my my biggest thing was just staying calm and asking for that forgiveness. But I think it was better for me to do it when I did it, which was probably a good almost like, man, probably six, seven years, something like that. Because mm-hmm. if I would have probably tried to do it like right away in high school or something like that, yeah, I probably would have been like, do yeah. you know what you did to me? Right. So. I am glad that it was at a time in my life where I was able to stay calm and be able to then talk to him that way. Well, Victor, uh, man, I wish we could have another hour. I did this with a lot of my guests because we can talk, you know, uh, for forever. And I hope this is the last, last time we talk. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, I would really want to just say you no know, to everybody, anybody out there that just feels like their life isn't going anywhere or they feel stuck, feels that they're going through so much pain or even if they went through so much pain, they're still holding it in. Just forgive and try to make better of your own personal life as far as appreciating yourself, be positive with yourself and keeping your head up because down the line, you never know the great wonders that can re- can arrive at your, literally at your doorstep at your face in your heart there's a, an amazing amount of things but you really have to see that positive side you got that right you are on point um i, I appreciate you coming on my show uh victor and i've been i was looking forward to this show for weeks and uh uh how can people reach you so they can reach me at um almost bullied to death um at gmail.com or even through heyugly.org uh, there's a link there. They can actually reach me on there. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Victor. Uh, and uh, I encourage you to stay with what you're doing because I think you're still going to impact lives and uh, don't give up on that. So as I end all my shows, I want everyone to smile infectiously, laugh genuinely, love unconditionally, Live courageously. I never get tired of saying those four things because it uh, it's my passion. And I think those four things are important in everyone's lives. And That's true. I believe, I believe in every single one of you. 
And uh, I know great things are going to happen in life as long as you stay passionate and uh, you keep that dream in front of you every single day. And uh, your life is going to change. So have a great week, folks.